As the super flu wound down, there was a second epidemic that took out, at least in the US, roughly 16% of the survivors. In a strictly Darwinian sense, it was the final cut, the unkindest cut of all, some might say. Outside Atlanta, five-year-old Sam Talber had been in shock since his whole family died from super flu. Wandering in a blackberry field behind his house, he didn't notice the rotten well cover half buried in the berry creepers. In Lodi, California, Irma Fayette was reading on her porch when a hippie man approached her. A 26-year-old virgin, Irma had been morbidly afraid of rape her entire life. At the sight of the hippie, Irma put down her magazine and picked up her gun. The pistol exploded when she pulled the trigger, killing her instantly. No great loss. In Nyack, New York, George McDougal saw his 12 immediate family members die from the flu. On doctor's orders, he started jogging 10 years ago. Now he jogged to keep the thoughts of his loved ones, Jeff, Marty, Helen, Harriet, Bill, George, behind him. Until, 51 years of age, on the corner of Oak and Pine, he suffered a massive coronary. Miss Eileen Drummond of Clewiston, Florida, took to getting very drunk on creme de menthe. Grieving over a photo album of her deceased family, Eileen lit a cigarette in bed and fell asleep with it. Most of Clewiston burned down that night. No great loss. In Reno, Nevada, Arthur Stimson stepped on a rusty nail after swimming in Lake Tahoe. The wound turned gangrenous and he died from shock and blood loss while trying to amputate his own foot. Swanville, Maine, 10-year-old Candace Morin fell off her bike and died of a fractured skull. In Harding County, New Mexico, the rancher Milton Craslow was bitten by a rattlesnake and died half an hour later. In Milltown, Kentucky, Judy Horton went down the walk-in freezer in her basement where she stored her husband Waldo and her little boy Petey. To her, the super flu had taken care of the two biggest mistakes of her life, but the freezer door accidentally shut and latched behind her, and Judy starved to death. In Detroit, heroin addict Richard Hoggins found a stash in his dead dealer's row house and shut up right there and then. The stuff was 96% pure and it hit his bloodstream like a highball in freight. Richie was dead six minutes later. No great loss. Do-da, do-da. Ride around all night. Ride around all day, do da, do da. The last meal served in Lloyd's cell block had been eight days ago. In one of his cell's corners was the skeleton of a rat he'd killed in Trash cell five days ago. The tail was still intact because it was too tough to eat. Despite his efforts to conserve it, almost all the water in Lloyd's toilet bowl was gone. He had been peeing into the corridor so as to not contaminate his meager supply. Just last night, he'd eaten a cockroach. It wasn't half bad, much tastier than the rat though he'd felt it scuttering madly in his mouth before his teeth crunched down on it. Lloyd didn't want to eat Trask. He didn't want to become a cannibal. It was like the rat. He wanted to have Trask within reach, just in case. Do da, do da, do da. The main reason Lloyd was still alive? He was too full of hate to die, and all his hate coalesced into one simple, imagistic concept, the key. The key was your reward for following the rules. They, the ones who had locked him away, had the key, and they could do what they wanted to you. But not this, not leave him to die a slow, horrible death. Please. If only he had the key. At first, Lloyd thought his hate was a useful thing because the owners of the key would have succumbed to the superflu already. They would be beyond the reach of his vengeance. Then, little by little, as he grew hungrier, Lloyd realized, the flu only would kill losers like him. It wouldn't dare touch those who had the key. But Lloyd would. If he lived long enough to get out, he would touch them plenty. Camp Town ladies, sing this song. Come on, come on. Nothing personal. I ain't gonna eat you, old buddy. Not unless I have to. Lloyd wasn't even aware that he was caressing Trask's leg, nor that he was salivating. Poor lunch. Stu and Glenn washed themselves in a cold, clear stream. At lunch, Stu ate hugely of everything except the caviar. He learned Bateman's story, that he'd been a sociology professor at Woodsbury College, that his wife had died 10 years ago and that they'd been childless, that when superflu happened, Bateman accepted it with equanimity because he said, at least, he would be able to retire the paint full time, as he always wanted to do. Was Kojak your dog before? No, that would have been an amazing coincidence, wouldn't it? No, I believe Kojak belongs to somebody across town. I took the liberty of rechristening him. Say, will you excuse me a minute, Stu? Forgot I have something cooling in the river. These were supposed to go with the meal. Stupid of me. They taste just as good afterwards. 
Bubonic plague, the Black Death, decimated Europe near the end of the 14th century. The dancing sickness took place during the latter part of the 15th. Whooping cough near the end of the 17th. The first outbreaks of influenza happened near the end of the 19th. Hell, we're so used to the idea of the flu now. But what everyone forgets is 100 years ago, it didn't exist. What are you getting at, Glenn? Let's walk for a bit. During the last three decades of any given century, Stu, religious maniacs arise and claim that Armageddon is finally, finally at hand. Such people are always there, of course, but the numbers tend to swell during those troubled times. And more people start taking them seriously. Monsters appear. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Jack the Ripper, Lizzie Borden, Charles Manson, and Richard Speck, Ted Bundy in your own time, if you like. It's as if Western man needs an occasional high colonic, a purging, so he can face the new century clean and full of optimism. Only in this case, we've been given a super enema because it's the end. It's not the end, Glenn. At least, I don't think so. Just intermission. You ever have bad dreams, Stu? He thought of Elder lurching after him in his nightmares, and of corridors that never ended but only switched back on themselves. Sometimes, ever since boyhood, I've been plagued by amazingly vivid dreams. But lately, lately, I've been having one that's like the sum of all bad dreams. I wake up feeling as if it wasn't a dream at all, but a vision, what is it? It's a man, at least, I think it's a man. He's standing on the roof of a high building. Maybe it's a cliff he's on. It's sunset, but he's looking the other way, east. I can't see his face, but he has red eyes, and I have a feeling that he's looking for me. And sooner or later, he will find me, and I will be forced to go with him, and that will be the end of me. So I try to scream and- That's when you wake up? Yes. It's just a dream, I suppose. Represented my unconscious fear that some leader or leaders will start the whole mess going again. And by mess, I mean society. You think that's possible, Glenn? Man is a gregarious social animal. Eventually, we'll pull ourselves back together. And when these new societies arise, they'll once again use technology as their cornerstone. At least in the Western world. Because, my friend, we are hooked. These new leaders won't remember the corner we had painted ourselves into before the super flu. The dirty rivers, the hole in the ozone layer, the atom bomb, the pollution, the, the... Glenn? This dream of mine, Stu, it preys on me. After deciding Stu would spend the night at Bateman's house in Woodville, the two men walked down Route 302. Bateman talked an endless monologue, theorizing that eventually there would be hundreds of little enclaves scattered around the country where thousands of doomsday weapons had been left around like a child's set of blocks. They discussed which animals would die out, which would flourish. Bateman wondered aloud if any of the babies born from this point on would be immune, or if any other babies could even be born. Oddly though, the thing Stu's mind kept returning to was Glenn's dream about the man with no face. And that night, asleep on Bateman's couch, Stu had his own nightmare. He was back in Stovington. Elder was dead. Everyone was dead. It was a tomb, and he couldn't find his way out. He passed into a part of the installation he had never seen, crowded with people who hadn't died from the flu, but who had been murdered. He glimpsed a sign on a locked room. Then, blessedly, he saw a door to the outside world standing open. Beyond it, the sweet, fragrant night. In his dream, Stu plunged towards it, but as he neared it, a figure stepped into the doorway, blocking his escape. A cold, black shadow where his face should have been. Two soulless red eyes, flickering with a kind of lunatic glee. His hands were dripping with blood, Stu saw. Heaven and Earth. All of Heaven and Earth. Stu jolted awake, afraid he had screamed, but in the next room, Glenn Bateman's breathing was slow and regular. Kojak, though, moaned softly in the hallway, and Stu supposed that even dogs had nightmares sometimes. They were perfectly natural things, dreams and nightmares, but Stu wouldn't be able to sleep again until the first slivers of dawn appeared in the window. I've gone to Stovington, Vermont, Plague Center, US 1 to Wells, 95 to Portland, US 302 to Barrel, 89 to Stoving, leaving Agunquit, July 2nd, Harold Emery Lauder, Francis Goldsmith. You really think that was necessary, Harold? I don't know. Most people this way would be traveling along the US 1 and would see it. Anyway, it can't hurt. Why did you sign both our names? Well, because we're a team, aren't we? For me, she thought. He did it for me. I guess we are. Hungry? As a bear. That night, they ate a supper of Kool-Aid and canned food at Fran's house. Afterwards, they listened to a record of an old battery-operated phonograph Harold found in his attic. 
They sat on the couch for hours, listening as the music of a dead world filled the summer night. Anyone home? At first, the sound was so far away and strange that Lloyd thought he might be dreaming it. Anybody home? Going once, going twice. Strangely, Lloyd's first thought was, don't answer, maybe he'll go away. Okay, I'm leaving now. Just about to shake the dust of Phoenix from my boots. No, don't go, please don't go. Oh, someone sounds hungry. Lloyd wanted to burst into tears of relief, but it was fear he felt in his heart. A terrible, growing dread. The first thing Lloyd saw were the boots. Poke had a pair like that. Then the belt buckle. Then the flushed face. Boo! Ah! You poor guy. You look like an advertisement for DeChow. What's your name, soldier? Lloyd Henry. Please, mister. Can you let me out? I'll do anything. I, I'm starving. Look at me, Lloyd. The right hand was holding something up next to the right eye. A stone? No. A key. The key. Now you're a man who appreciates the value of a good key. Mister, I'm awfully hungry. Sure you are. A rat isn't a thing to eat. Neither is that fine fellow in the next cell. I only say that because it looks like his left leg is missing a few pieces. And there are teeth marks. You know what I had for lunch? A nice rare roast beef sandwich on Vienna bread with a few onions and some golden spicy mustard. Some home fries and chocolate milk to go with it. Holy cow, I haven't introduced myself, have I? The name's Flag, with a double G. I'm gonna make you my right-hand man, Lloyd. I'm gonna put you right up there with St. Peter. What a deal, right? Y yes but you'd like to get even with the people who left you here. Isn't that right? The anger again, replacing the fear. Yes, sir, I would. Now, you aren't very bright, but you are the first, and I have a feeling you might be very loyal. You and I, Lloyd? We're gonna go far. All I need is your word. Word? That we're gonna stick together. You and me. No denials. There will be others soon. They already know their way west. But for now, there's just us. I'll give you the key if you give me your promise. Ah, promise. The sound of tumblers in the lockbox turning. The door rolling open. Free, Lloyd. Come on out. Lloyd stepped out of his cell and something was pressed into his hand. The key. It's yours now, Lloyd. Mine. Shall we get you some dinner? Got a lot of driving to do tonight. Dinner? Uh, all right. Yes, there's such a lot to do. Things are going to begin moving very, very fast.